Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me virtually today from his car, it's my friend Jonathan Grant. Hey. Hey, buddy. I'm in a car. (laughs) Doing all right. Uh, Trying to avoid the the folks because I live with my parents because I'm a winner. Yeah, there Um, you go. And my mom uh, uh, swims in the pool every day naked. And I don't want people saying that. It's fair. I, uh, I think that yeah. might be d- too distracting from the issue at hand, which is the movie you wanted to talk to me about today, which is, I, yes. I, I, we, we will say it's not your first choice, but I I'm, know I'm, uh, <laughs> my first choice for the chaplain heads in the audience was Monsieur Verdoux, the late career Charlie Chaplin film. Cause I got criterion collection. Oh, you did uh, uh, subscribe to criterion. Yes, I've been watching all the Chaplin films and Pasolini. It's the best. Nice. Highly recommend. Um, Yeah. So the thing about Monsieur Verdoux. (laughs) That's it. We'll say that's bonus content. We'll save that one for later. Bonus content for the for the Chaplin fans. For the true for the true Chaplin uh, for the true mustache (laughs) connoisseurs. Did, yeah. Cha- did Chaplin re- have like a rabid fan base? I'm not. I I imagine he probably did, given that he was one of I mean, maybe five the, celebrities at the time. It was the early 1900s, so a lot of people had rabies and all sorts of diseases. I'm sure he had a lot of rabid fans. A- hey, I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, the movie you decided to talk to me about is yes, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes, hated it. It's. Uh- <laughs> It's understandable that you'd hate this movie. A lot of people did. It's the lowest, not uh, out of all of the Best Picture nominees in Oscars history, it is the only Best Picture nominee that, uh, the only one that beat it with a lower score is extremely loud and incredibly close. This is not a good movie. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's an incredibly mediocre biopic that punched above its weight and somehow won an Oscar. I think just because people love the band Queen and they love the music of Queen Mm -hmm. and had it been, had you made the same biopic about any other band, uh, which you easily could, you could literally swap out the people and make it about another band and no one would notice because it's so mediocre. Uh, (laughs) No one would care. It's just because we love Queen and Queen's music, and the music is really good. My parents, for example, who are both older, they're in their 80s. They did not listen to Queen when they Queen was current, mm-hmm. but they saw the movie and loved it and keep re-watching it purely because they like the songs from it. It's so weird. So It's such yeah. a weird time to look back on that year, on 2018 in movies. And see, like, the kinds of things... I mean, I was looking at... You know, I'd never seen this movie until you brought it up. And I've had people who talked about maybe wanting to talk about it on the show before. And I'd had a lot of people sort of express the similar opinions as what you've got, which is this movie is mediocre. It's totally average. The only reason that Rami Malek won is because he does a good imitation of a guy. A A good SNL imitation of a guy. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just totally average. And I knew that there was a lot yeah. of stuff cuz this movie uh, you know came out in 2018 after being in development hell for some time. Sacha yeah. Baron Cohen as we all know famously was originally supposed to star in this when it was first being shopped around I think post Borat. Yes, and it's hard to not compare the film that could have been the film that he said he wanted to make with the one in front of us and the one he wanted to make looked so much more interesting because he wanted to focus on the interesting part of Freddie Mercury's life, the excesses. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a fun movie. 
Um, instead, this seems like an attempt by the members of Queen to make them all seem like uh, chaste family men who only cared about the music and right. never lost their way. And the only people who ever took in, uh, advantage of Freddie Mercury was that one Irish boyfriend who got him into drugs and drugs are bad. Winners yes. don't use drugs. That scene at the party, I fucking like when they want to leave early. I'm like, you are seventies rock stars at the height of your fame. There's no way no I fucking way. believe you. <laughs> no, I, Oh, I just want to go home and spend time with my wife. I don't want to use drugs. You have drugs at this party. How dare you? Next thing you know, people will be having sex. Time for me to go home and read my Bible and continue writing great songs that people love. Yes, I have to go kiss my children goodnight. How dare you suggest <laughs> that I do yeah. cocaine off of a Bible? I have to read I have to read all of the Gospels. Yeah, no, I want to see the stuff that he talked about in interviews, the crazy stories like uh, dwarves walking around with plates on their head full of cocaine. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff I want to see. I want to see gay orgies. I want to see uh, Freddie Mercury uh, trying to get rough trade in a trailer park bathroom. Yeah. While I'm poor. That's the stuff that's interesting. The stuff that I don't really care about is the, um, you know, chaste family men who really love working. <laughs> not a it's movie just, that's interesting. Yeah, it's not, a, this movie's really uninteresting and really middle of the road, and I feel like, and this, yeah. this, there's something that was occurring to me as I was watching it. Uh, this movie originally, of course, uh, another infamous aspect of this movie is that it was directed by Brian Singer. For yes. <laughs> two thirds of the movie, he but, and then all of a sudden, everybody was like, "Oh wait, he he's got trouble and he rapes kids allegedly." Yes. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm sure I, when the Brian Singer yeah. when the Brian Singer biopic comes out, it'll be him like taking uh, orphans to the zoo, <laughs> while the other uh, guys that he had parties with are like, "Oh man, we got to go home, spend time with our families." Uh, Sorry, yeah, our yeah. families have kids, and then Brian Singer's like, kids? Huh? <laughs> Let's turn this party up a little bit, shall we? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Brian Singer obviously directed the movie, and he was he was let go yes. due to a, a, a bevy of reasons, it sounds like. And Dexter Fletcher was brought in. And Dexter Fletcher mm -hmm. later went on to direct Rocket Man, which... Yes. A, 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 a totally different lane of mediocre biopic, but one that at least had some inventive parts to it and some things that seemed well, a little bit fresh. I haven't seen Rocket Man, actually. I'll add it to my list of add mediocre list. rock songs to watch after this. If you're looking for something totally okay, <laughs> that's fun. Because okay. this is the thing. It, 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 when I watched Rocket Man, cause, which I've also talked about for this show, Rocket Man is yeah. at least fun. You know, there's not a whole lot of it, it's not particularly well written and yeah. it's a musical outright as opposed to Bohemian Rhapsody which is basically just a mixtape. See, already that makes it more fun. Like if yeah. this had been if Bohemian Rhapsody had been a musical, I would have been slightly more on board and maybe more forgiving cuz you can get away with kind of lame plots in a musical. For mm -hmm. some reason, and we can't. Yeah, in like a, a regular film, and it's Elton John is kind of hard to make uninteresting. Mm -hmm. He's inherently flamboyant. I, you could literally just watch him change outfits, and that'd be fascinating. I mean, that's a lot of what the movie is: is him changing outfits over and over <laughs> and over again. I think that adds to such a layer. But Dexter Fletcher. Yeah came in and finished this movie. He finished Bohemian Rhapsody after Brian Singer was booted from the project. And yeah. having watched both Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man now, I really wish, because Dexter Fletcher was originally supposed to direct Bohemian Rhapsody. And then they were like, yeah, let's give Brian Singer a shot. Let's just throw him a bone. And yeah. if they just let Dexter Fletcher make this movie, then it would have been better. Based on how at least like okay, but reaching for something Rocket Man was, Bohemian Rhapsody yes. is just dog shit by comparison. Yes, they turned in a, a perfectly passable 
very mediocre film that could have been brilliant had they gone along with all the, had they focused on more of the excess and the interesting parts. Mm -hmm. It seems like they wanted to ignore purposely anything that was interesting about themselves because it might portray the band in a bad light. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Uh, because I don't know. I feel like, I guess they won an Oscar either way. So they, their mission was accomplished, but it could have been so much more. Yeah. It could have been, it could have been an actual, like challenging, interesting movie. And instead you got something that people in their eighties can watch over and over and over again and feel good about. Yes. And the thing I hate most about it. So Mike Myers character is completely fictional and made up for the purpose of the film. Yep. The original executive actually loved Bohemian Rhapsody. His only problem with it was the the length of time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, again, it's, I I don't know, to me, real history is always more interesting than fake. And I know we have to massage it to fit a film narrative sometimes, but it didn't add anything. And it seems, strikes me that the only reason they put Mike Myers in there was to make one joke. It's a very cringy joke. Yeah. Yeah which was the, uh, and I'm going to fuck up the wording, but it was basically kids aren't going to be sitting in cars banging their heads to this, which is obviously a reference to Wayne's World where he does exactly that. Right. So all I could think is somebody, probably the band was like, hey, be really funny if he said that. (laughs) Right? Because he did it in that movie. Yeah, and people are remembering that. Yeah, we're so good at, at writing movies, guys. Ah, uh, references. Uh, Everybody loves those. Yeah. it's um, So one thing that this movie has in common with the uh, late Chaplin vehicle, Monsieur Verdoux, <laughs> is <laughs> there's a drive to be likable uh, yeah. that you can really sense. Um, in this movie, nobody ever fucks Freddy over. So none of the living people ever did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Instead they uh, take Freddie's boyfriend and make him the bad guy when I'm sure it was way more complicated right. and probably more interesting. Uh, and then they have Freddie betray them by going off and doing a solo career, which honestly seems kind of lame because I'm sure, I don't know the actual history behind it, but I'd be shocked if all of them didn't try to do solo careers. It seems like a thing a popular band does. Yeah. At the very minimum, Um, at least Freddie Mercury and Brian May are probably trying to go solo. Yes. It just doesn't Um, make sense. Here's before we go too far. Then I would like to see the trailer for this movie. Cause I, let's watch. I don't really remember it, but it was, it was there. Yeah. Nope. Getting Let's it on screen. Check it out. Let's check it out. Let's see a trailer. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? I enjoyed the show. I also I write a song. Our uh, lead singer just quit. And then you'll need someone new. I love the way you move on stage. The whole room belongs to you. Don't you see what you could be? No one will play us on the radio. We need to get experimental. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. <laughs> Do it again. One more. How many more Galileos do you want? Roger, there's only room in this band for one hysterical queen. Mark these words. No one will play a queen. Fortune favours the bold. Freddie, Uh, concerning your private life. What more do you need to know? I make music. I want to give the audience a song that they can perform. (laughs) What's the lyric? Ready, Freddie? Let's do it. We are the champions, my friend. 
Yeah, this trailer is really... You know how trailers are supposed to make movies look watchable? Yeah. And by doing that, they tend to sacrifice a lot of the actual storytelling. Yes. This trailer well, sacrifices none of the storytelling. It, told, it tells the entire story <laughs> of the movie, which is paper thin. The whole, movie well, notice- is, the whole movie is predicated on the story of, oh, you remember this band? They, they well, sure well, were a band. Notice in the trailer, uh, the Brian May character mm-hmm. is the one who says, hey, guys, we got to get experimental. And then yeah. they also have the scene where he's like, <laughs> stop. Yeah, uh, he invents that or we will rock you. Um, yes, that's the most interesting scene. That's something we really need to know about the band's history is the day they decided to clap along with the song. Yeah. Fascinating. Oh, Thank you for my letting God. me into that. Groundbreaking. Um, groundbreaking, which again is how he wants to be perceived as this groundbreaking, brilliant artist. And it wasn't all Freddie, guys. Just so you know, us mm-hmm. other members of the band were also a part of this. Um, it, it, it's becoming more and more apparent that, you know, we, we uh, if you look back in the history of how this film was made, you can easily connect the dots and see that Queen has been involved in the making of the movie from yes. pretty much the very beginning, right? You know, it, well, it, if you look at the development, you yeah. can see back in September 2010 that Brian May said that there was going to be a movie about Queen. And there, uh, the original version as pitched to Sasha Baron Cohen is that uh, Freddie Mercury dies midway through the film and the film carries on with just the surviving members of Queen and shows how they struggled uh and succeeded despite losing their lead singer. Right. And that's the thing. And that's the original reason why there was a problem is because Sacha Baron Cohen, in addition to having creative differences in notions yes. like that, which is, a, it's just like, come on, you have yeah. Sacha Baron Cohen wanted to tell the interesting story about Freddie Mercury, the R rated yes. version and Brian May and company wanted to be like, oh, well, this is, let's just have a PG fun sing-along movie. I, it's, I think it's because good uh, films and good writing and good storytelling demands lots of conflict. Mm-hmm. It's the classic throw your character up a tree and then set dogs on them. Right. And throw rocks at them. Right. And they seem loath to have any sort of conflict that puts puts them even like even something as simple as this like the way freddie mercury joins the band in the movie is uh he hands them the lyrics and says hey i love what you guys do and they say well too late we don't have a lead singer well wait a minute i can sing conveniently Mm -hmm. which is less interesting to me than the real story which is he was a fan who asked them multiple times to join the band right that tells me the story of an outsider desperate to get in. Right. And to see that concert rejection, but it would make the band leaders look like uh, the, the other bandmates look like dicks, mm-hmm. um, which they didn't want to look like. Uh, and, and then on top of it, you, by dumbing down those story elements, they yeah. forced the writing to be so expositional and on the nose during some of those scenes. Like that yes. scene in particular, there's the part where they're like, well, you can't, you need a new lead singer. But he's like, oh, well, I can sing. And then he sings a thing. He sings like a, a, a you know, a belting of something. And then he goes and explain. they're like, oh, you can't sing with those teeth, can you? Then he sings and then he's like, I have extra incisors in my mouth. That means I have a bigger range. <laughs> <laughs> you know how people talk, how people talk yeah. about their mouths. Perfectly natural dialogue. Oh, yes. Yeah. That well, that line it, is... Sorry, go ahead. I mean, Freddie Mercury did believe that about himself, but he never... I, d- I doubt he had a moment like that. Yeah. Also, if I, if I saw somebody who had extra teeth, my first thought wouldn't be, well, that guy obviously can't sing. Right. <laughs> That's one <laughs> stereotype we all know about people with two uh, big teeth. They bad can't at singing. sing. Horrible at no singing. No way to be a rock star. 
You ever heard a yeah. horse sing? Me neither. That's what I yeah. say. And if it's one thing we know about 70s rock bands, all of them were incredibly handsome and none of them looked weird in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So obviously that would disqualify. <laughs> it's just stupid. Um, There's a lot of really yeah, bad so writing in this movie, yeah. Bad writing and weird um, minimal conflicts instead of the, the bigger, more interesting conflicts. Yeah. Like I, one, of the, one of the scenes that really stood out to me in as a sort of a, an amalgam of all of those problems was the scene where yeah. Freddie comes out to uh, I'm so far uh, uh, Mary where he comes out to Mary yes. and initially he start he you know we, we've seen what's going on he's. Uh, he's not banging dudes in truck stop bathrooms because this is a PG 13 movie, but he's, he's making yeah. eye contact with them and lusting after them as they walk into bathrooms. And that's, <laughs> that's close enough for a PG 13 movie. There's uh, somebody who 100% saw that scene. Probably my dad uh, with Freddie Mercury following the guy into the bathroom. And was like, huh, why'd they show him having to just go to the bathroom? Right. Yeah. Why was you making eye contact with that guy about that bathroom? Is that a really nice bathroom or I something? See, huh? I want to see uh, Rami Malek sucking a guy off through a glory hole. Yes. At an Alabama gas station. Sounds great. And yeah. can we make it so that guy is not also Adam Lambert in a bit of stunt casting, please? Can we avoid that? <laughs> uh, Fuck no, the stunt be, casting uh, in this movie. <laughs> should be Mark uh, uh, Mike Myers... Uh, dressed as a uh, version of his Wayne's world character. Yeah. But like an older 1970s version who's a gay mm -hmm. trucker. I support that. Now the yeah. scene, so he comes out to Mary who is his girlfriend, fiance. And he's basically like, at first he's beating around the bush about it. He's like, Oh, I'm bisexual. And she's like, yes. no, you're, and then she comes in. She's like, no, you're gay. And yes. I'm mad, but it's not your fault. And it's just so just on, like you can tell that they're trying to, to get the audience to be like, Oh, it's not his fault. His he's a gay guy, but it's okay, yeah. man. They still love each other. This must be complicated. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Again, I think the real story is more interesting, which is, um, from what I understand, it seems like, she actually knew he was gay from the beginning mm -hmm. and that they just got along really well. Um, and that's the real history and the complications of that is always more interesting to me. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's so much more interesting to show what the actual conflict was like and the actual, yes. and not cause it's, that's the thing. It's not even a conflict. It's yeah. just more interesting to show what the actual relationship was like. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a conflict in the sense of here's a woman who's decided to marry a man that she believes is gay, mm -hmm. who is carrying on affairs, and they're finding a way to make that work. Because I'm sure they did have fights, and I'm sure that it was uh, much more complicated than it appears in the, the movie. Right. Um, he obviously cared for her because he left her in his will. He bought a house next to her. Uh, that stuff was real. And I think it's in the film as well. Mm -hmm. um, and she was also the person who took care of all of his cats. Yeah. He had a lot of cats. <laughs> yeah. Which is also a real Freddie Mercury fact. Apparently it is. I don't remember cat. when we did uh, the historical roast episode about Freddie Mercury, we did a lot of research and uh, there's a lot of stuff that they got correct factually. Yeah. You know, Freddie Mercury did like to, you know, his his standard mode of singing was with the mic on the stand, but pulled out of the actual bass. Yeah. And he did have a piano as his headboard for his bed, and he did keep a lot of cats. Yeah. But there's so many <laughs> <That's> elements. <laughs> the, the piano headboard scene, uh, that's something, I don't know why it bothers me so much in biopics, uh, where it's like... Uh, they, they always have some moment where the person like accidentally stumbles upon the thing that they're known for. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I'm just going to, uh, 
play a few notes on the piano. Oh, it just happens to be one of my most famous songs. Yeah. By oh, the way, man, maybe I mean, this will be something. Wink, I wink. believe in it. Wink. Yeah. <laughs> I always find that, especially if it's not uh, a comedy where they're purposely making, like, referencing it, like, say, Shakespeare in Love, mm-hmm. where the whole purpose of that movie is those references. It just, oh, God, I always find it kind of lame. It's and lame. I found it, it lame in this movie. But that's the thing is lame sells because yeah. a majority of people can get on board with lame because they're going to be it's like, they, they recognize it. Yes. Yeah. Well, like I'm sure a lot of people showed up to watch the late Chaplin movie, Monsieur Verdoux, <laughs> and did like <laughs> the subplot where he has a family that he needs to take care of, which is why he's murdering wealthy widows. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this movie's a really that's that's the biggest flaw with this movie is that it could have taken a, such an interesting story and made it all yeah. tedious paint by numbers bullshit. They uh, had yeah. Did you get whiplash during the scene where they speak to the agent too? Yeah, with the quick for cuts? sure. And this is something that yeah. I this is the only part of the movie that I'd seen until talking about it with you today. And this is a scene that is notorious because it won the, the movie won a few Oscars. It won yeah. uh, obviously, of course, you know, for Rami Malek won for best actor, and it won a couple below the line ones, notably film editing, because <laughs> hey, flashy biopic stuff. This is what editing yeah. is, right? Editing is cool words, yeah. and editing is oh man. Sometimes there's a scene where it's really zoomed in on him when he's sad. That's what editing is. Uh. <laughs> and this this scene is notorious because I remember after the the movie won best editing, a lot of people were posting this scene on you know like Twitter and Facebook and saying like, well, this is what good editing looks like, guys. Yeah, no, uh, a lot of editors were upset because it, yeah, it's so uh, such uh, very quick cuts and it takes you out of the scene, mm-hmm. which is the opposite of what good editing is supposed to do. Right. And apparently Let's, the reason behind it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, because this scene is it's a very simple scene. You know, let's take a look. It's this scene yeah. where they have the band meeting their agent for the first time. It's straightforward. You don't need to make a ton of flashy, cool editing choices in this. This is a conversation happening at a brunch. Yes. It's all there is. I'm going to count the cuts as they go. Usually so put it just got be cool. Wow. Okay, there's one. Two. I've got a impression, darling. You look like an angry lizard. Four. Five. Your best work. Six. Seven. Eight. Fly away. Nine. Ten. Can I borrow it for Sunday church? Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. 16, 17? Why? I can't. I don't want to keep counting anymore. So this, this is, is horrible. And you, There's no need for this. You gotta love, Mr. Freddie Mercury. You gotta love uh, You've Freddie got Mercury's trill costume. So tell me, oh, yeah. what makes Queen any different from all of the other wannabe rock stars I meet? Let's find out. I'll tell you what it is. We're four misfits who don't belong together playing to the other misfits. The outcasts, right at the back of the room, who are pretty sure they don't belong either. We belong to them. We're a family. But no two of us are the same. Paul. Paul Prenter, meet Queen, our new signing. You know what I love about a a movie, too, is when they have one interesting thing to say, and then they undercut it by saying a very uninteresting cliche thing. And then, yes. it's only the biggest television program in the country. All right, now we can we can we don't have to watch this anymore. We've seen we've seen all of the horrible editing that we need, where they're cutting between people needlessly. Remember the classic screenwriting rule of um, tell don't show, which they do very well here. They do a great <laughs> job of telling you what's going on, and also showing you, hey, we told you this thing. Yeah, uh, this we'll, play we'll this doesn't this, this this plays out. Sorry, go ahead. You know what would be better than just telling us they're a band for the misfits and the freaks at the back? Showing us something that indicates they're for the misfits and freaks mm-hmm. in the back. Right. Something, anything. Um, 
Same with the family thing. Show them having fun. Like, up to that point in the film, I don't think they showed them, like, just hanging out, having fun, doing family stuff. Nope. Didn't they were arguing, they were upset with each other, or they were like figuring yeah. out things. It's just so, uh, it's so strange to watch this movie and think this is an acclaimed classic. Yeah. Cause it's not even that it's, it's barely that, but people loved it. No, it's, it'll be forgotten, uh, reasonably soon, like within a year or two. I think the, the uh, editor honestly, apologized. Honestly. <laughs> he apologized for how bad the editing was as well. He should. I nearly got whiplash from the speed of those cuts. It's so bad. Uh, yeah. Well, and I think he said part of the reason they had the quick cuts was because they like were filming in a crowded space. No, the main reason so why they was they had to mix Brian Singer shot scenes and Dexter Fletcher shot scenes. Ah. Instead of just doing reshoots. Yeah. Which uh, would have made well, more sense. It's good. it's good to see that the Oscar's great on a curve. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, th- keep in mind, this is also the year that Green Book won Best Picture, so we can just hold this, throw this whole year out as a wash. I mean, honestly, if you look at the history of the Oscars anyways, most of those films are forgotten. There are a few that stand the test of time, but like there's not a lot of matchup between like all the greatest films that we remember Mm -hmm. and the ones that get Oscar nods. Um, Like, oh God, they're, they're a bunch like Citizen Kane. Yep. Uncut Uh, Gems. I don't think that was an Oscar. What's that? Uncut Gems got nominated for zero Oscars. Yes. Uncut Gems got nominated for zero. Uh, I mean, even like, Films that have had a lot of uh, cultural, like Dark Knight, Back to the Future, Back to the Future, Future, Indiana Jones, those films, Groundhog Day, have had a lot of cultural. What's that? Groundhog Day. Yes, those films have had a lot of cultural relevance and have lasted. People still talk about them. They still watch those films. Nothing, as far as the Oscars goes, from what I recall. Yeah, I know they got nominated for, like, Back to the Future, and I believe Groundhog Day got screenplay nominations. But a lot of that stuff just doesn't really... It's not tickling the Oscar voters' fancy. Yeah, and not that it necessarily should, because they're, you know, kids' movies. But they did become classics over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I got one question for you. To sort of uh, yeah. to sort of put a bow on things, because I feel like we've really squeezed this the the rag of this movie dry and wrung it out for almost all of its juice. Yes, there's a lot of problems that I have in this movie, and there's a lot of stuff that we you know normally as I sort of wrap things up, I would normally ask what we would do to fix the movie, but we spent so much of the time of this show talking about fixing it's the movie. Me. I want to I want to ask and see what you think about what I felt was the most just horrible padded out part of the movie. Yes. And completely unnecessary in my opinion, which is the live aid sequence. Yes. It was literally just a reshot remake of the live aid, uh, concert. Mm -hmm. Um, what I hated the most was the the little segment before that, where he's on his way to the concert. Oh yeah. It's like, Time, time to resolve every problem I've ever had in my life. Let me yeah. stop by my family's house. Hey, mom and dad, I'm gay. And by the way, you super accept it. And now, and here's my lover, and I'm going to go to this concert now. Uh, <laughs> yep. Remember this was, line I said to you at the beginning of the movie? You said it to me at the beginning of the movie, Dad. I'm going to say it yeah. to you now, and we're going to be okay with each other. Yes. It just felt uh, rushed and lame and not good writing and very on the nose. Um, they just use it to get to live aid. Yes. I'd say my other big problem with, uh, Monsieur Verdu is that, um, he tries to make it an anti-war film when it really should be more like the movie kind hearts and coronets, just a straight black comedy. Don't try to make your lead redeemed at uh-huh. the end. Sorry. Um, well, uh, let's take, I, I can't, Freddie Mercury's a rap scallion. We don't need to redeem him. We already love him. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Show us the um, flaws. 
Yeah, I, that was uh, the live aid sequence. It did feel like it was padding out the movie. Um, and I you honestly feel it. it would have been a stronger. It would have been a stronger choice had they just shown live the real live aid. Mm-hmm. Because I, it would be more interesting to see that. Yeah, and the fact that you're leading into it with this bad sequence. Do we have that scene? Is there? Do we have it pulled up? There's that. It's just. For all of the parts where you're showing what really happened, quote unquote, to show yeah. something that actually did happen that we can go watch on YouTube. You can go watch that whole sequence. It's more interesting yeah. than the entirety of Bohemian Rhapsody is the actual yes. Live Aid concert. Yes. And they did it so they could cut to other people. Like at one point, don't they cut to the Mike Myers record exec? Yep. Yeah. So again, it's a very lame Seinfeld ending summation. It's it's like the episode of Seinfeld where they make Seinfeld into a show within the show, mm-hmm. and then they premiere it, and then they cut to all the people that Seinfeld has wronged throughout the course of the show. Yeah, and they each have a reaction. It yeah, this looks like that. it's the. This looks like it's the right scene. Yeah, let's take a look. So this should be the yeah. scene that's right before. No, no, this is the side by side. No, 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 no. I don't know if we we might they might not have it on YouTube. But it's basically the sequence. I mean, John didn't even mince words. You described it perfectly. It's him going to his family and saying, "This is my boyfriend. I'm gay. I uh, I'm about to go do the show because I want to give charity to the children, just like you did, uh, just like yeah. you taught me to, Dad." Yeah. And it's just so bad, and I. Uh, it, the only way it could have been more pandering is if he pulled out a guitar, ripped a solo, and then got on an eagle, mm-hmm. a bald eagle that flew him over an American flag background to the Live Aid concert. Right. And I was talking That's right before. <laughs> I, I was talking with with Anthony and Gage here at the studio right before we got on the air today about how watching this watching movies for this show is is fun. I like doing it. Because a lot of the times people pick a really bad movie or a really good movie that they don't like for some reason. And so we get some interesting dichotomy and it's, and it's, there's at least something fascinating going on with a movie like yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody. It's exhausting because it's boring and middle of the road and mediocre and not even horrifically yeah. bad. It's, it's just not so sad. Bad it's yeah. It's not so bad that it's a fun movie. Um, it's just, uh, kind of dull and I found myself uh, like when I was re-watching it mm-hmm. uh, I had to stay awake <laughs> my sleeping schedule is off oh um, yeah I can imagine so I got up early this morning so I could re-watch it and I fell asleep during parts and kind of zoned out during parts because it's just there's a lot where not very much happens of interest mm-hmm. um, and a lot of Kind of sitcom-y fighting and very predictable action. Like pre- everything is predictable. Yeah, and I hate there was that. nothing in the film. Yeah, there's nothing in the film that makes you go, "Whoa, I couldn't have seen that happening," or "I had no idea the band got up to stuff like that." Right. Which is, I think, if we already know everything that's going to happen in this, then why bother making it? Yeah. What's the point? Now, is there a movie um, that you would recommend people watch instead of Bohemian Rhapsody? Maybe another music-based film or a biopic that you think is absolutely worth it? Um, <laughs> a music-based film. Uh, I've watched and rewatched Little Shop of Horrors quite a bit. Oh, good choice. Yeah, you I love, love that Shop. movie. I love the song. Yeah, I can rewatch that endlessly. Uh, in terms of biopics, honestly, my favorite biopic is the fictional one, Walk Hard. Another musical-based biopic. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Um, it's really funny. It hits all the beats uh, perfectly of a biopic and makes fun of all of them. Mm-hmm. In fact, it kind of hits all the same beats as this one, but in a funny way. Yeah. And there were some moments where... Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody almost lapsed into a parody of a biopic because it was so tropey and so generic. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if you're going to watch a, a tropey biopic, Walk Hard is the one to watch. It's very funny. The songs are great. 
and it really should have done far better than it did, I think. I think I'm going to have to give that a rewatch soon because I watched it years ago and I I just haven't seen it since. I think it's time. I need to cleanse my... I watched two mediocre movies back-to-back for the show today. I just need to cleanse my palate a little bit. Yeah. I think Walk Hard might be a good palate cleanse. I'd recommend Criterion Collection. Uh, They have a Netflix-style app where you can watch all the classic great films. Uh, I've been watching all of the Chaplin movies. (laughs) Like Monsieur Verdue. Yes, uh, uh, skip that one. Um, watch the kid. That's a really good one. It's silent but great, starring uh, Jackie Coogan, who played Uncle Fester on oh. the Adams Family. Fun facts. Well, John, thanks yeah. for sitting in your car and talking to me for about a good a good chunk of time. I hope you're not dying of heat stroke in there. Oh no, I have the air conditioner on. Great. Smart man. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It was a pleasure to talk about both Bohemian Rhapsody and the late Chaplin film, Monsieur Verdue. <laughs> and uh, John and I, when we're when we're not under uh, unprecedented pandemic times, we do perform together at the Pack Theater. But in the meantime, when uh, when we're until we get out of this, where can the listeners find you? Uh, they can. <laughs> where can they find me? Um, I'm mostly at home. <laughs> I'm I meant your work. Really on. <laughs> oh, my work. I, I'm not on social media. I, I guess follow me on uh, uh, Instagram. I'm on Instagram. I occasionally post things there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We should. Um, I'll post. I'll send. You should post this if you haven't already. The video of you doing writing the balance board and playing the banjo. Oh yes, I I should post that. That's great. Uh, I think I did actually on my Instagram. It's Post on there. it again. It's a TBT. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Pack Theater. You and I have a show mm-hmm. that will hopefully start up again when things reopen. Fingers crossed. Feed me. Yeah. But, um, I, will, I will wait to officially plug that until we're back in business. That's fair. Um, let's see. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, <laughs> I'm we'll keep it. We'll keep it at your Instagram. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, Holly Philos is my Instagram, P-O-L-Y-P-H-I-L-O-S. I'm really good at marketing. Um, there you go. Yeah, uh, you can also see me um, in The Laughter of Every Child. Uh, you, you can see me when you look up into the heavens and see a shooting star. That's me. Dream it on a wish. <laughs> go ahead and dream oh, them on a wish, and folks. I'm on the, uh, uh, Joey Clift, uh, I'm on the uh, 50 States Project album. I have a bunch of songs on that. Um, comedian Joey Clift has finished the Sufjan Stevens 50 States Project by oh, getting a yeah. group of comedian four songs on albums for all of the 50 states. He's releasing the second wave uh, of states, including Puerto Rico. Um, but yeah, they did vote check, for statehood. check that out. Right yeah, on. Uh, check that out. I'm on a couple of those albums, and I designed a couple of the album covers. Uh, I designed the album cover for Wisconsin. I have uh, songs on uh, California album, the Colorado album, and I think uh, a few others. So cool. yeah, check that out. You can find it on um, uh, SoundCloud. Right on. Well, I'll have links to that in the yeah. show notes also, and uh, you can find me at Diet J. And that's on Twitter and Instagram. If you like the show, support us on Patreon. Subscribe at $2, $5, $10 levels. You got all sorts of fun goodies and access to special things uh, that are movie related and otherwise. And this has been Blockbusting. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Go see something good for a change. (laughs) 